Hey, Kyle. I see RJ, Denise, and Gary. Hi, guys. Okay, I'm unmuted. I'm here. Hi, yeah. Gary. How's it going? Good. I'm trying to recognize people. Uh, so we have Bryce Earlbeck yeah. with, uh, mm -hmm. and Bryce, if I don't say your last name right, please correct me. Um, with, uh, you know, he's obviously an organic farmer, but he also works with AgriSecure. And then we have Kyle Schnell, an organic farmer, and uh, also, um, you know, Schnell Seeds. Do you do you sell? Do you sell seed, Kyle? Yeah, uh, uh, channel seed, but kind of going by the wayside now that organics here. Okay, okay. And then uh, we have Katie Hyde with Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship. And I was telling these guys that, um, you know, we had over 20 RSVPs for this event, but as you know, last time we had over 30 and we only had 12, 13 people that showed up. So we may not have a lot of uh, people attend today, which is totally fine because we'll go ahead and share this on our YouTube channel and I'll tag various, um, you know, hashtags that pertain to our, you know, uh, organic farmer, organic farming, um, or growing organic expertise. And that way folks can still find this information um, via YouTube, which I think could be very beneficial. So the only person that I, I don't think I've met officially is RJ. RJ, if you want to unmute yourself and say who you are and, and you know, just a couple of words about you and what you do, that'd be great. Yeah. Hello, everybody. My name is RJ Kreckler. I'm with Blue River um, Organic Seed and FBN. I lead the seed sales team um, at Blue River and FBN and just wanted to take the opportunity to learn a little bit more about uh, the organic side and and see what we can do as a business to help organic farmers and, and just it, this is more just learning for me uh, excellent yeah to, and that's to, exactly who these uh, workshops are catered to so thank you for taking the time out of your business schedule to attend this event uh, and I'm sorry, I didn't officially introduce myself. My name is Olga Redding and I am with Iowa Organic Association and I'm in charge of education and outreach. Uh, so I'm the one organizing, uh, you know, any and all educational events for Iowa. So I look for more exciting uh, workshops coming up with Denise uh, O'Brien here. Uh, she's uh, on our board too. Denise and Gary, if you guys wanna say a couple words about you and what you do, just for the rest, for the sake of everyone else, that'd be great. Uh, I can go first, Denise. I hit the button quicker than you did. Um, well, I live in Ames uh, and I have a farming background in that I, I farmed in Northeast Iowa. Uh, and then I did uh, horticultural crops by Maxwell on a 21 acre farm that we sold at the farmer's market in Des Moines and other places. So I was certified organic then a couple years when I did those vegetables, but the market didn't really need the sort of organic, uh, and it was, I dropped it. But now chair of the Organic Association's Board of Directors, which is cool. Um, and I'm also kind of like always soaking in information, so that's kind of why I'm here. Awesome, thanks for being here, Gary. So hi, good morning, uh, afternoon now. I'm, I'm just signing off of another Zoom. Mm. <laughs> trying to um, focus in on this, sorry. Uh, so I'm Denise O'Brien, I'm near Atlantic, Iowa. I'm between Atlantic and Elkhorn. And I've been an organic farmer since 1976 and certified for the last 10 years. And um, we, always used, um, we always used organic practices, but um, we never certified. It never was really important. It, it, it was important, but not important. Um, we milked cows for 20 years. We never had a market. So we just, we, we uh, were always hoping that Organic Valley would make it out to Western Iowa and that would never happen or that we would do our own farm process, on farm processing. So I'm a vegetable farmer now and a greenhouse grower. I grow bedding plants and uh, 
and I'm certified through um, the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship. And the, our, we were required to certify organic when we got our, um, when, when we, we got our um, high tunnel grant from our local uh, soil and water conservation district. They, they had it under the equip program and it's different from every, every county. And, but ours required that and it was okay because we believe in it and we did it and we got um, a $5,000 grant on our, on our high tunnel. So it was worth doing that. And I must say that, um, that being um, certified keeps me on my toes and keeps me a better bookkeeper and a record keeper. That's so. awesome. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Denise. Um, and thank you for being here today. Um, what I'll do, you guys, is I'll share my screen and kind of show you the agenda for today. Uh, and I'll go ahead and jump into my presentation after I share the agenda with you guys. So um, here's what we have planned for today. So um, I thought Roz would jump in. She might still jump in later. Um, Roz is our executive director for Iowa Organic Association. And here in a couple of minutes, I'll go ahead and talk about um, USDA organic history and background. And then after that, Katie Hyde with Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship. Uh, she's an organic handler specialist for IDOLS. Uh, she'll talk about organic regulations and a little bit more um, in de detail information regarding uh, certification overview. Uh, finally, at 1.15, we'll go ahead and take a little short break, stretch, stretch it out, you know, um, do, do our thing, and then come back at 1.30. And at 1.30, um, John Hendrickson was going to be a, a presenter, but unfortunately, um, he had a, a family emergency. So Jim will present for both of them today. And they will speak about the all grain uh, uh, compass uh, tool that they uh, created uh, that is there to help organic farmers uh, figure out where they will be financially uh, up to 10 years. So it's a pretty neat uh, tool. I'm very excited for you guys to learn more about it. And then finally, uh, we'll wrap it up with uh, Bryce and Kyle, uh, two organic farmers here in Iowa. Uh, they'll talk about about their operation, how they farm organically, challenges, opportunities, and uh, finally we'll open to a little bit of a Q&A. However, if you guys have any questions that come in, you know, in the midst of the presentation, feel free to use the chat box and I would be more than happy to relay those questions after the presenter is uh, done with their uh, you know, discussion or their PowerPoint slides. So I'll go ahead and share my uh, PowerPoint presentation. And we'll go ahead and um, do a slideshow. So um, we have a little bit of organic trivia. So hopefully you guys came prepared uh, and have uh, uh, and are excited for this. So what is the number one organic commodity in the US measured in sales? Does anyone Soy know? Soybean. <laughs> no, okay. Make it corn, I don't know. Okay, okay. All right, it's actually, no. It's actually milk. Yes, yeah, so milk has been, um, uh, you know, the first in 2015 and still takes first place in 2019 with $1.59 billion. As you can see, you know, eggs and broilers switched places here in 2019, but they are still top five as they have been since 2015. So as you can see, milk, broilers, eggs, apples, and lettuce. All right. What is the number one organic field crop in the US measured in sales? Corn. All right. Yes, good, good job. Uh, corn is, uh, is it, and it, um, it's a 70% change from, uh, oh gosh, what is it, 2016? 
All right. The next question is, what is the number one in organic corn grain production, acres of bushels harvested? So what is the number one state? Sorry, forgot to mention that. This reminds me of kind of white and missing things. I'll say corn. What is the state that- Oh, yeah, yeah, so, I'm sorry, Iowa. <laughs> yes, yes, good job. It's gotta be Iowa. Yes, Iowa is it. Um, Iowa has uh, 37,000 acres, um, 5 million bushels and $38 million in sales. And Minnesota is number two. All right, what state is number one in organic soybean production in acres and bushels harvested? And, we, and now I'm gonna make somebody else guess besides Gary. <laughs> And not winning anything. I know, I know. And we have somebody else that joined from an iPad. Uh, hi there. All right. It's Iowa again. It's Iowa again with 22,000 acres. Uh, 864,000 bushels and $15.5 million in sales. Michigan is number two. Okay, so uh, uh, here is the 2019 Certified Organic Survey. And um, what's interesting about this survey is that um, it, 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 you know, things are still growing. So the biggest takeaway is that organic is not just a trend, organic is here to stay. So what I wanna to point to is that, is this right here. So this survey showed that there's total sales of $9.93 billion in organic commodity products, an increase of 2.37 billion or 31% from 2016. According to the survey, there were 16,585 certified organic farms in the U.S. last year, a 17% increase from 2016, which accounted for 5.5 million certified acres, an increase of 9% over 2016. So this, you know, this is very encouraging to me, and I hope to see more and more growth. So what, what is organic production? Um, as it comes from the National Organic Program, uh, it is a production system that is managed in accordance with the Organic Food Production Act to respond to site-specific conditions by integrating cultural, biological, and mechanical practices that foster cycling of resources, promote ecological balance, and conserve biodiversity. Um, it, it is a systems approach. Uh, so there are a few things, you know, as far as that's concerned. There's minimal use of external uh, inputs, uh, such as synthetic fertilizers, synthetic pesticides, growth hormones, antibiotics, and any genetically modified organisms, also known as GMOs. Um, the type of organic uh, agriculture uses a management that maintains and enhances ecological balance and uh, takes into control soil and water conservation and improvement. It also uses waste to increase biodiversity on the farm and its surroundings, uses crop rotations and cover crops to recycle nutrients, build soil quality and disrupt pest and weed cycles, and use of biological and mechanical pest controls are a last resort. So a little bit of history about the organic agriculture. Uh, one of the founding um, people in organic agriculture is Sir Albert Howard. Um, as you can see, he was born in the late 1800s. He is uh, the father of modern composting practices. He wrote an agricultural testament in the 1940s and emphasized the importance of humans holding water in the soil um, and um, uh, influenced J.I. Rodale, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later here in the coming up slides. 
one of the quotes from uh, Sir Albert Howard is, the maintenance of the fertility of the soil is the first condition of any permanent system of agriculture. So that's something um, that uh, obviously we uh, organic farmers keep in our minds. Um, Lady Eve Balfour is another um, uh, person that was part of the organic movement. Uh, she designed the first long-term comparison of organic and conventional agricultural methods and wrote The Living Soil in the 1943. And um, one of the quotes from her book is, the most frequently heard argument is that intensive chemical farming provides the only hope of feeding the expanding world population and has therefore to be accepted whether we like it or not. To me, it seems probable that the exact opposite could prove to be the case and that it is an alternative and largely organic agriculture that will be forced upon us whether we like it or not. And we like it, so we're cool with that. J.I. Rodale, uh, you guys may have heard of our Rodale Institute. Um, he is the father of modern organic farming movement. Uh, he founded Rodale Inc. Publishing in the 1930s. Um, he also uh, had the Organic Farming and Gardening ma Magazine in the 1942. Um, finally, he purchased a farm in Pennsylvania in 41 and founded the Soil and Health Foundation in 47. Um, you know, through this farm, he fostered a scientific research um, and study, uh, provided the main source of information about non-chemical farming methods and was heavily influential in development of organic production methods. And again, as you can see, there is a recurring th theme, healthy soil, healthy food, healthy people. Um, J.I.'s uh, son, Robert Rodale, uh, he followed his father's uh, footsteps and uh, bought a 333-acre farm in uh, Cutstown, Pennsylvania in 1972, began a farming systems trial in 81, the longest running organic versus conventional comparison in the United States, um, introduced New Farm Magazine in 79 and coined the term regenerative, regenerative organic to distinguish a kind of farming that goes beyond sustainable. So, uh, there, there were many standards and many certifiers prior to the Organic Foods Production Act of 1990, which was finally implemented in 2002. And as uh, of 2002, there's only one universal standard, organic certified. And here you, on the bottom of the screen, you are seeing some logos for some certifying agencies that uh, help farmers or producers or handlers become organic certified. So brief history of the organic movement. Um, as you have seen, uh, the 70s was a big area for the organic movement and um, demand kept increasing. People wanted more organic products. Uh, however, there was no uh, single body that was in charge of the certification. It was decentralized certification program in the 80s. Each state had their own rules. And uh, finally in 1990, Congress passed the Organic Foods Production Act, also known as o OFPA, and USDA was designated to write the rules and regulations to explain the laws to producers, handlers, and certifiers. And the National Organic Standards Board established to make recommendations for allowable substances in organic production and handling and to help USDA write these regulation, reg regulations. So as you can see, it took them 12 years to finally get the National Organic Program written and implemented. And it is, um, uh, you know, section 2101 um, that you can definitely look into further if you're interested. Um, there's actually more information here. Uh, uh, the electronic code of federal regulations, uh, you know, you can delve into it. It's part 205. But um, 
uh, it's the it's mandated by the Organic Foods Production Act, like we've mentioned before, OFPA, the law, and administered by USDA Agricultural Marketing Services and defined by the Agricultural Code of Regulations, Part 205, how it operates and what it regulates. So there's, you know, you can really get deep into it if you, if you want to. The National Organics Standards Board, uh, they are an important uh, uh, piece to this puzzle, if you may. They are appointed by the US Secretary of Agriculture for a five year term. And they make recommendations concerning the implementation of the National Organic Program. They meet twice a year and they have 15 members. And um, as you can see here, there's a few different types of members in, you know, that they need to include. They have to have organic farming operations, organic handling operations. Um, uh, they have to have retail establishment, uh, folks from that area. We have they have to have environmental protection and resources conservation experts, uh, consumer interest groups, uh, someone that is um, a, a expert in toxicology, ecology, and biochemistry, and finally at least one USDA accredited certifying agent. So as you can see, it's a very a uh, broad spectrum group that encompasses in, you know, a lot of people that are involved in this movement. All right, so USDA Organic Integrity Database. If you haven't heard about this database, this is a tool that is available to the public. You can actually go on this database and and do a search for your entire state to see who in your state is organic certified. Or you can even do by your city. Uh, you know, there's various ways that you can filter your search results, but it gives you the opportunity to really uh, explore organic farmers in your area, in addition to promoting market visibility for organic operations. Mm -hmm. Trends and farmer perspectives. Uh, so from the 2019 survey, uh, we are, uh, the state of Iowa is actually six uh, state in the production of organic um, from compared to everyone else here in the country. Obviously, California is the first. They have always been the first. Um, and then, uh, as you can see, our neighbor, uh, uh, Wisconsin, is second. Certified organic farms in the US, um, the map kind of follows, uh, you know, those states that are leading. So uh, California with uh, uh, 3000 farms and for example, Iowa here with 779. Acres onto production in Iowa, uh, these are, um, you know, uh, conventional. So corn, we have 14.4 million, soybeans, we have 9.3 and million, and wheat, we have 12,000. Uh, compared to certified organic, which is 38,000, certified organic soybean, which is 21,000, and wheat, which is 1,300. So as you can see, um, you know, the organic uh, acres are, are definitely quite a bit less than the conventional. So what that tells me is there is huge opportunity for growth. Uh, Roz actually had to do this for uh, um, a newspaper that interviewed her and she actually went uh, through all the organic um, operations in Iowa by county. So you can kind of see, uh, you know, um, all the counties in the state have an organic operation, which is very encouraging. So there are some that only have one and others, you know, that obviously have quite a bit more. Uh, so our goal is to uh, help spread the word and help encourage more organic farms throughout the state into the future. So hopefully we see more. 
Um, the Organic Trade Association, this is their logo right here. They are an amazing resource. Um, they, they do a lot of um, research with um, organic farmers, handlers, uh, anyone and everyone that's certified organic uh, to just um, really learn from uh, everyone. And they have made huge inroad into the household holds. Um, and what they figured out is that organic products are in more than 82% uh, of American homes. Uh, there are numbers of states in which 90% or more of households now buy organic on regular basis, and even the lowest levels uh, all hover around 70%. So what that tells me, you guys, is that, um, you know, there's... Uh, the organic movement is very strong and people are becoming more and more aware. And there was also a study that millennials uh, are the biggest uh, decision makers nowadays as far as their purchasing power is concerned. And once millennials become parents, they don't waver on organic for their kids. So, um, you know, this movement is only going to get bigger and stronger with millennials becoming parents, which is exciting. Here are some trends uh, and, um, and value. Organic sales exceed $55 billion in 2019. It's the fastest growing agriculture segment. Um, you know, here's some more information, but what I really want to show you here is that, uh, you know, um, organic as a percentage of total organic food versus uh, conventional food is actually growing, which is exciting to see. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, hopefully the trend continues, which it will. Um, so for anyone that is interested to learn about markets and where, uh, you know, corn and organic corn and soybeans are, feel free to go on our website, uh, iowaorganic.org. And um, here is this uh, orange box that says markets. And that's where you can find the most recent information on prices. And uh, as of, uh, you know, as recent as we could find it, conventional corn is 585 a bushel, where organic corn is 7.49 a bushel, which is 155% premium. And then soybeans are at 12 92 a bushel, where organic soybeans are at 1797 a bushel. Uh, this is last year's info, which is about 139% premium. So what is the opportunity for Iowa farmers? Um, U.S. demand is relying on organic grain imports into the United States approximately 20% of the organic corn that is used for feed in the U.S. is actually imported, believe it or not. Organic whole corn that is important comes from Argentina, and cracked corn that is important generally originates in Turkey. Um, and then on the other side, approximately 70% of the organic soybeans and organic soybean meal that is consumed in the U.S. are also imported. Most of the imports that make their way in the, into the U.S. are exported from India. So um, wouldn't it be great if we can uh, bridge the gap and, and reduce these numbers uh, and, and start uh, uh, you know, growing our own organic corn and soybeans rather than constantly importing it? All right, so organic exports reached 548 million in 2016. For US, uh, the top organic exports were apples, grapes, and lettuce. For Canada and Mexico accounted for 70% of the US organic exports. And then Jap Japan, Taiwan, South Korea were also among United States top trade partners for organic products. Excuse me. And then US organic imports equaled $1.65 billion in 2016. Uh, quite a big number. Uh, top US organic imports included bananas, coffee, olive oil, corn, and soybeans. 
corn and soybeans is highlighted for a reason. Uh, Turkey, Mexico, Italy, Peru, Ecuador supplied 43% of the imports and 87 countries supplied organic products into the United States. This is a slide that um, uh, Ross pulled from Rodale Institute, and um, it just it talks about um, the decade long research that has shown organic systems are competitive with conventional yields after a five year transition period produce yields up to 40% higher in times of drought earn three to six times greater profits for farmers, leach no toxic chemicals into waterways, use 45% less energy and release 40% fewer carbon emissions. Um, this is uh, from Rodale Institute Farming Systems Trial. Uh, so, uh, you know, they have different systems that they are implementing and between all the systems that they have they they have about 72 uh different uh trials going on uh and um the biggest thing that i want to point out here is the economic analysis and for income expenses returns uh in organic and conventional systems so as you can see organic is in green conventional is in gray so as far as income, organic has uh, a good uh, leverage on conventional expenses are slightly lower. So in the end, returns end up being higher for the organic farmers. So from a farmer perspective on organic transition, um, what is the reason that a farmer gets into organic? And most of them are, you know, it fits my uh, my or my family's values, 91%, the biggest majority. Concerns about environment is a big one too. Potential enhancement on farm sustainability is a big one too as well. Um, farmer perspectives on organic transition and what are the major obstacles? So the major obstacles are weed management, uh, about 53% are concerned with that and cost of the organic certification. Uh, uh, what kind of support farmers are looking to get? Mentoring from experienced organic farmers is number one. One-on-one -on -one technical assistance during transition is number two. And in-person workshops or short courses is number three. And that's what we are offering today. All right, so as far as resources, there are so many. I'm going to try to go through them pretty quick. Um, we have um, the FSA Organic Certification Cost Share Program. And um, here is the website and you can go to your county to get more details. Uh, but um, this cost share program is available to organic farmers that are uh, you know, not in a transition period, but are actually already organic certified. And you can get up to 50% of your certification costs paid during the program year, not to exceed $500 per certification scope. So that's something that as, as an organic farmer, you definitely want to take advantage of to, um, you know, get this reimbursement from your local FSA. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, uh, another a resource available to organic farmers is the organic um, equip organic initiative. And actually uh, Denise at the beginning of our conversation mentioned it and it, it varies, um, you know, based on your uh, farm and your acres, uh, but uh, there is substantial help that you can get for this program. Uh, I think I saw a number up to $30,000 a year and even more depending on, on uh, where you are uh, with acres and, and whatnot. In addition, the USDA National Organic Program also has this uh, uh, you know, um, website with a, an amazing array of resources that you can look into. 
uh, as well as the Organic Integrity Learning Center. And there are uh, a variety of modules that you can take to like uh, learn about things uh, such as becoming certified and, and uh, regulations. Um, the NRCS, uh, Growing Organic, they have this uh, a booklet available on their website. This is the link to go find it. It's a pretty extensive tool. And finally, uh, we, Iowa Organic Association, we have our organic resource directory. And this directory, is um, you know available in paper copy. If you wish to receive a copy, feel free to let me or Rosno. I would be more than happy to mail you one or two or however many copies you'd like. Uh, it's a really uh, great uh, resource where you can find a variety of different organic, um, you know, may that be farmers or seed suppliers or soil testing labs. Um, and uh, it is also available in a PDF format on our website under the resources tab. So uh, definitely feel free to check it out online or let me know if you want a paper copy. Uh, Dr. Kathleen Dellett uh, with Iowa State University uh, is, um, uh, you know, a very important person here in Iowa. She's been doing a lot of organic research, and uh, we are very thankful to her and what she's doing. Uh, and she has uh, quite a bit of resources on her extension and outreach page as well. Midwest Organic and Sustainable Education Service, also known as MOSES. Uh, they have a page um, with a, a bunch of resources and uh, definitely check them out. And then University of Wisconsin-Madison All Grain Network, uh, they also have an amazing array of uh, resources, including that compass tool that um, Jim will be talking about here shortly. Rodale Institute, um, you know, this page right here, you know, you can check out as well, as well as the organic transition course that is available through their page. You know, it talks about why organic and, uh, you know, soils, crops, livestock, marketing, and certification. Uh, very great tool for your toolbox. The Organic Agronomy Training Service, also known as OATS, is another resource. And then the National Center for Appropriate Technology. Um, it's uh, also ATRA, Sustainable Agriculture, they have, uh, you know, a section on organic farming that you can certainly uh, look into as well. And then uh, SARE, which is, uh, stands for Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. They have a learning center and modules and uh, different topics and content that you can explore. And thanks to SARE and the grant that we receive from them, we are able to deliver these workshops to you. So we're grateful for that. And finally, the eOrganic website, uh, another tool for your toolbox. So you guys, I know I breezed through this pretty quickly. Um, if you have any questions for me or need additional information, please, please, you know, call or email. Uh, I am here to help in any way I can. If I don't know the answer to your question, I'm always, uh, uh, you know, I can research and find an answer or at least point you into the right direction. Uh, so, um, with that being said, I'm proud to say I'm on time and a couple minutes short. Uh, so that's good news. Uh, that means that Katie Hyde with Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship can move forward with her presentation. However, I, I do want to give you a couple of minutes to, you know, um, let me know if there are any questions that have come up while you saw the presentation.
if there are no questions at the moment, that's totally fine. If they pop later, feel free to add, enter them in your in the chat box. Um, but at the moment, then we'll go ahead and move forward with Katie's presentation. Katie, if you are ready to go, I think we are. Okay, sounds good. I'll go ahead and share my screen here. Let's see. Okay. All right. Uh, my name is Katie Hyde. I am the organic handler specialist here at the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship, also known as IDOLS. Um, I organic handler specialist. My position is um, working with the processors and handlers across the state um, that who certify as organic. I also um, do have about 100 farmers that I'm their uh, file manager for as well. Um, so um, currently, the Iowa Department of Agriculture's organic program is taking new clients. Um, there was a couple years there that we uh, couldn't just because of our staffing. Um, but with attrition, uh, changes to other people's um, production systems, you know, some people will um, drop out or whatever the case may be. But so yes, we are now accepting new clients. Uh, also for the handler and the processor side, we're always taking new clients. Um, those can be, people can submit their applications at any time throughout the year. For producers though, those the very last deadline or the last day to submit those are um, April 15th. So. That being said, all right, so the organic claim, uh, what it is not. So organic does not necessarily mean chemical free, does not necessarily mean natural, and it's it's not a health claim. Um, and that's what a lot of um, consumers may feel like they're synonymous, and it isn't necessarily. Uh, natural versus organic, um, the use of the term natural is not regulated. Um, whereas the term organic is highly regulated by the USDA, um, the National Organic Program, or the NOP. Um, so if anybody could put natural on their label, but there's not going to be any regulations pertaining to that and uh, regulations that people need to follow to list that word natural on there, whereas organic you would. The benefit of the National Organic Program regulations is that there's a uniform Organic production and processing requirements throughout the U.S., uniform labeling of organic products, and the established compliance procedures and enforcement. So Iowa Department of Agriculture is a certifier. There's numerous other certifiers across the state and the nation uh, and the world. There are, IDOLS is only one of a, several certifiers here in the state of Iowa. There's um, I believe there's 10 or 12 other certifiers that do certify producers and other processors and handlers as organic throughout the state. Um, but we are a state agency and some people prefer for, you know, to have a state agency as their certifier, but we all have to follow and be accredited with the national organic program, private certifiers or state. Uh, again, organic is chemical free and chemical free is organic. That's not necessarily true. Um, there are certain uh, chemicals that you can use in organic uh, production system, but those would have to be reviewed uh, by your certifier before you use it. Local food is organic and organic food is local. Again, not necessarily. Um, just just because you're local doesn't mean that somebody's not using a prohibited substance, which then that would be a conventional product. They wouldn't be able to label that as organic. Um, but while it's great to purchase locally grown food, it, that's fabulous, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's organic. And organic could come from anywhere. So um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna be a local food product. So what is the National Organic Program? Um, Olga kind of went over this already, but the um, AMS or the Agricultural Marketing Service of the USDA established the NOP um, back in 2002. Uh, that is when the Iowa Department of Agriculture's Organic Program became accredited with the NOP. 
the National Organic Program. Um, the state did have their own organic program in place, I believe, in 98, but once the national rules went into place, that's when we became accredited. So what does organic mean? Organic refers to a complete production and processing system that's inspected and audited for compliance with federal regulations on an annual basis. And organic is a labeling term that's highly regulated by the USDA's National Organic Program. So anytime there's a label um, on a can of soup or on a clamshell of berries, um, that needs to have been reviewed by a certifier and the producer or the processor needs to be certified as organic. Um, by an accredited certifier. So who must be certified? Uh, operations that grow, process, and sell products as organic must be certified. There are some exemptions and exclusions, of course. Um, anyone who has sales of less than $5,000, uh, handling operations of products containing less than 70% organic ingredients, um, and so they could have a, a made with claim on there. Um, and then handling operations that do not process or repackage the organic product. So this is why your local grocery store like Hy-Vee would not have to be certified or organic if they're just bringing in products that they're not repackaging or relabeling. Uh, the NOP is um, exploring the changing some of these exemptions and exclusions. So there may be a um, regulation changes pertaining to that for traceability and just making sure the, of the integrity of, the or, of organic as a whole. So going organic uh, from seed, from soil to seed to sale. So how do I get there from here? You would develop an organic system plan or your OSP, uh, comply with the organic requirements, maintain records, and then you get your certification. I usually say that maintaining a record is like 85% of being certified as organic just because you have to maintain records. You need to show everything. There's got to be traceability. Um, so maintaining records is a huge deal. Um, these are just a couple forms here of our applications for the organic certification. Um, the application packets divided into numerous sections to reflect the different requirements for becoming certified as organic. Your application is the organic system plan, um, and so we can use that word interchange interchangeably. So application, organic system plan, OSP, um, and this must be updated annually. Um, so we do send out renewal for renewal applications every year um, in January or February of the certification year. Okay, so what I'm going to go over now are the requirements. Um, these are basically the sections of the OSP or the Organic System Plan. And so these um, right here the uh, is broken down into your OSP. So you'll have a section for your land requirements, soil fertility and crop nutrient management, seeds and planting stock, crop pest, weed and disease management, harvest handling and storage, and your record keeping. So for your land requirements, you need to have a 36-month transition period from the last application of a prohibited substance to harvest of first organic crop. Um, so an example would be June 1st, 2017, a prohibited substance was applied. Uh, then once you go through that transitionary period, you can have your first organic harvest on June 1st, 2020. So it doesn't mean that you'd have to go through an entire um, year, um, extra year on top of that. It would be at the anniversary date of that um, prohibited substance and when that was applied. Um, some additional land requirements include a boundary between your organic farm and a non-organic area. Um, it should be something easily observable that your inspector would be able to view. Um, and uh, the buffer area between, wait, buffers, okay, so buffers the area between the boundary, uh, the boundary and the organic production area. So um, some people will have a, a grass strip or um, some people will, um, they can use, still harvest that if they're going to have hay there and they could feed that off to a um, conventional livestock. Okay. 
chemical drift, um, it's this can occur. Um, you want to take uh, whatever you can to prevent that. But if you do notice drift, um, you need to make sure to report that to your certifier. Um, the drift should also be reported to the um, IDOL's Pesticide Bureau. They're here at the Department of Agriculture. Um, when there is a chemical drift, a residue testing would be conducted, and that would be conducted by our staff inspector, um, Jamie Meyer. Um, and I believe that they'd also do a um, testing with, from the Pesticide Bureau. And fields that incur chemical drift must go through the three-year transition period again. Uh, it wouldn't have to be your entire farm, just whatever um, fields were affected, and there'd have to be a 30, uh, approximately a 30-foot buffer. Um, or whatever makes sense. There's, it's not a hard and fast rule, 30 feet, but that's generally what we say. Um, you want to safeguard against that drift. Um, you register with uh, Drift Watch. You can place roadside signage. Uh, we have that little no spray um, sign available here um, at the department. Um, and you can also send a written notification to highway departments, electric companies, neighbors, aerial applicators. The drift watch, uh, basically the counties and I believe aerial applicators will take a look at that um, site to see where there's sensitive crops. Uh, the highway departments, electric company, you want to make sure that they're not spraying in your ditches and that. So biodiversity is really important with, with um, organic. Uh, organic farming refers to a production system that responds to spite site-specific conditions by integrating cultural, biological, and mechanical practices that foster cycling of resources, promote ecological balance, and conserve biodiversity. Um, so benefit of organic agriculture ecosystems, um, it reduce, organic will reduce pesticide residues in the water and food, reduce nutrient pollution, improve soil tilth, soil organic matter and productivity, and lower energy use. Uh, there's also carbon sequestration and enhanced biodiversity. Uh, one of the things that an inspector will look for is if there's, um, if you keep unmown areas, if there's a pond, if there's uh, different areas that allow for um, wildlife. Soil fertility and crop nutrient management. Um, so select tillage, cultivation, and crop rotation practices that maintain or improve soil condition. There's certain um, crop rotations that you would or would not be able to um, do under the NOP's regulations, um, such as corn on corn on corn on corn, or um, would not be allowed. Um, and manage anim plant and animal materials to maintain or improve organic matter without contributing to contamination of plant, soil, and water. Uh, sewage sludge is prohibited as being a fertilizing product on any organic operation. Animal manure can be used um, as long as you incorporate that 120-day rule um, before harvest if the food portion contacts the soil or the 90 days prior to harvest if the food portion does not contact the soil. Um, and then, oh, I think I go, uh, I'll talk about that later, but you'd also need to obtain a, if you're getting the manure from a farm that is not your own, you'd have to get an on or off farm manure affidavit where the supplier of the manure would indicate that that manure is untreated. So the next um, requirement for the OSP or the next section is our seeds and planting stock. Um, the requirement is that organic seeds and in organic seeds, annual seedlings, and planting stock must be used. And the exception to this would be um, you can plant an untreated non-GMO, non-organic seed if the organic is variety is not available. So if there's a variety that has characteristics that you really want to use, but you can't find it in organic, you, you may use an untreated non-GMO, non-organic seed. But in order to do that, you'd need to conduct a seed search, and that would be contacting at least three seed dealers that typically sell organic seed, um, document that search, and then uh, your inspector would ask to take a look at that seed search. 
And then if you have to use the non-GMO um, seed, uh, you would complete a non-GMO form, and that is, and that would have to be signed off by the um, seed supplier. Or they can write a statement indicating that it's not untreated non-GMO seed. Um, this is the verification of the untreated and non-genetically modified organisms. So this is the part where the um, the supplier would indicate the information, sign it, and then indicate their name. Uh, Non-organic perennial planting stock may be used um, as long as the land has undergone the three-year transition. So you can plant it and you'd wait a year and then you could um, certify, certify that as organic. Um, a, many of the, not all of them, but many planting stock won't even provide um, the fruit, harvestable fruit for a year or two even. So, but that's what you can do with the stock. Um, your crop rotation, um, you need to alternate crops. Uh, your crops must include, but not be limited to sod, cover crops, green manure crops that maintain or improve soil organic matter, provide for pest management, manage uh, deficient or excess plant nutrients and provide erosion control. So this would be on a yearly basis. So for alternating your crops, that's your crop rotation. You can do corn beans, corn beans um, for a maximum of four years, but then you'd have to go to a small grain, a cover crop, um, something to break up that, um, the corn bean rotation. Um, so crop pest, weed, and disease management, um, again, that crop rotation should be able to help you out with that as your crop nutrient management, uh, sanitation measures, um, like around any bins and that, and cultural practices that enhance the crop health, such as your plant selection. Mechanical or um, physical methods are the preferred way to um, manage any pests weeds and disease. You can introduce um, predators or parasites, development, development of habitat for natural enemies of pests, or use a non-synthetic control such as lures, traps, and repellents. I do say if you're going to um, introduce, introduce predators or parasites, you'd want to make sure that that's not an invasive species or anything that's going to um, have an actual negative effect on the environment. Uh, you can mow um, have livestock graze, hand weed. Uh, you can do use flame heat or electrical means for um, weeds. Um, and synthetic herbicides are prohibited. I did. I have had a question on the flame part. Um, you cannot get rid of gophers with flame, though. That's prohibited. <laughs> Um, so when the practice is listed and the regulation are insufficient for what I described as far as like the mechanical um, control of, pro of the pests, weeds, and diseases, a biological or botanical substance or a su substance included on the national list of synthetic substances allowed for use in organic production may be supplied. Um, the, uh, the national list is listed on the National Organic Program's um, website under the CFR. Or code of federal regulations. Non-synthetic substances are allowed unless prohibited on the national list, and synthetic substances are prohibited unless listed as allowed on the national list. Um, you can also, if, you, if you're already certified, um, you can contact your certifier to see if uh, the products that you want to use are um, allowed. This here is a materials database. If you are certified with, uh, by the Department of Agriculture, um, you would submit to your file manager any products that you want to use. Uh, we would review that. We'll put it into our materials database, and then uh, we will add that to your materials list. Any product that you want to use, submit to your file manager first and foremost so it can be reviewed. Um, and approved, or if it's already listed in this database, then we would tell you it's already listed, you may use it, and then we'll add that to your materials list. This um, database is not public, so you would have to contact your file manager. Um, so your harvest and handling, 
harvesting the crop, you dedicate harvest equipment for organic only, or clean and purge harvest equipment, and maintain an equipment cleanout documentation. This would include if you're having, um, if you're using a custom harvester, um, they would, you'd have them complete the equipment cleanout uh, log and then have them sign it. Crop storage, um, dedicate storage units for organic only, label all the organic units for organic use only, and identify storage areas and bins as organic. So if you have bins, you would submit a map, a field map to your file manager. And not only is it indicating where your fields are, but also your storage. And um, you'd indicate which ones are organic or, and or conventional. And um, you'd have to put like a physical sign on the bins to indicate that that's organic. So record keeping for producers, again, this is probably one of the more challenging <laughs> um, things for producers is to keep these records. But this is here is a list of all the things that you'd need to maintain and that the inspector would take a look at when they come out to your um, operation. So your input labels, um, any fertilizer, any pest control, um, invoices or receipts for, um, from purchase of seeds or plants. Um, also seed tags, um, your non-GMO untreated documents, if you are going to have to use a non-GMO um, seed, your equipment cleanout logs, sales documentations, transaction certificates, storage logs, your field activity logs, those can be on anything if you keep them your records in your phone or on a calendar on the wall or however you keep those as long as the inspector can view that at the time of the inspection. You also want to maintain soil tests and water tests um, and keep all of these records for five years. Um, for soil tests, you would need to obtain a soil test for if you're going to be using micronutrients um, because you need to show a deficiency in those micronutrients in order to use those products. And again, you'd have to provide that to your file manager for approval. So you would have to have a farm inspection. These occur annually. When the inspector comes out, they're gonna take a look at your field borders, crops, buffers, the equipment and storage areas. They'll review your OSP with you. Make sure that you're complying with the OSP that you have um, outlined, including your crop rotation. They're going to audit your records. Uh, there's a seed audit, storage audit, mass balance audit. Um, and then this will take about two to three hours, depending on how large or small your operation is. Um, at the end of the inspection, you have an exit interview, and this is where the inspector will communicate any concerns that were noticed. Um, they'll review everything with you. Um, and then they'll have you sign off on the exit interview. It'll also list your um, crops and the number of acres. Um, after the inspector leaves your operation, they will write up a narrative report and send that off to your file manager. Then they will review it and the certification staff reviews the inspection report. Uh, once the, your file manager reviews your inspection report, that is when they will issue the organic certificate. Um, and the certificates issued and the producer receives a copy of the inspection report as well as the exit interview and the, um, you'll also get an invoice for your certification fee, which I'll go over here in a minute. Your certificate indicates the scope of certification. So if you have um, crops or if you're a processor or handler uh, or if you have livestock or um, there's uh, wild crops too, I believe there's another scope. So here's the fees. Everybody wants to know all about the fees and how, how much it costs to be certified as organic. I can only speak up for idols because um, not all the fees are across the board. The same with all different certifiers. We have three fees affiliated with our program. These are annual that you'd need to pay every year. The application fee is $125. Um, that is due at the time that you submit your application or your organic system plan. The second fee is your inspection fee. 
And this is based on the number of scopes that you have. So if you only have crops, your fee will be $350. If you have crops and livestock, there's an additional $100 on there, so it'd be $450. The inspection fee is due at the time of inspection. Um, so you would pay your inspector that day. Then you have your certification fee. And this is going to vary based on the crop and the number of acres that you have of each crop with a $150 minimum. So an example of the different fees are if you have tree crops, um, that's $16.50 an acre. Vegetables are $27.50 an acre. And corn and soybeans are $6 an acre. And we do have a fee schedule that you get along with your application that indicates um, numerous other um, like small grains and breaks down uh, fallow uh, CRP, um, then the, and that'll break it down. But again, the the minimum is one hundred fifty dollars, and you will. This is the only fee that you're invoiced for um, because it's based on your um, your inspection and what we get back from the inspector. Um, Okay, so sampling, uh, because we are accredited with the National Organic Program, they do require that we sample and test a minimum of 5% of the operations that we certify. Uh, a client is not charged a fee for the sampling and testing. The testing is done by an accredited laboratory, and then you will receive back the results um, on that test. There's also unannounced inspections that were required um, to conduct, and again, that's in the, that's five percent of the operations that we certify as well. Um, typically, the unannounced inspections are completely random, or if we maybe sense something was off or had a question, um, we would have we would say Jamie Meyer again is our um, staff inspector. He's the only one that conducts the sampling and the unannounced inspections, um, we'd say, hey, you might want to go check out so-and-so for an unannounced inspection. Um, and this is beneficial just in getting an accurate picture of the operation because, um, I mean, not everybody is excited about getting an unannounced inspection, but, you know, that's what it is. Uh, the NOP Integrity Database, Olga had gone over. This is a really great tool. Um, like she said, you can just go in there and see who, you know, if your neighbors are certified as organic or anybody in, um, in your city or state, you can search. Or if you were at the grocery store and you were interested to see something about, you know, you can look it up either by the operation or you can even look it up by the certifier. Um, we, IDOLS, has recently just gotten a award for how frequently and timely we are able to update the integrity database with our clients. So we are up to date on that. And uh, so I'm kind of proud of that. <laughs> Thank you. Huda, Huda, okay. Katie. Yeah, that, that's Thank you. Definitely something to be proud of. And since we are actually uh, running uh, right on time today, we're just doing really good. Do you guys have any questions for Katie? If there are no questions for Katie. I'll, I'll, I'll ask one real quick because this I'm curious about something which you might know about more than I do, but are there very many certified organic meat processing facilities in the state? I know that the Story City Locker can do it, but uh -huh. I, I just, I don't know if there's a directory that says where they are, or is that really difficult? I'm just wondering. Gary, that is a fantastic question. I love it. I want people to go out there and encourage meat processors to look into uh, certifying as organic. We are, as a state, it's very low story um, city. Right. I know they're very busy um, that they have, I think, a waiting list even uh, for organic, but really um, few and far between. It's I well, would I, love, you know, love yeah. if anybody. Yeah. If anybody it's, would want to suggest um, for a for a facility to become certified as organic, because you're right, it is it is not. A lot, some people have to travel a long way that's yeah um, well, and, and 
and and it's probably I have another question. I I just was curious what you thought. Is it a is it a, is it doing is it becoming certified organic a more difficult proposition for a smaller facility versus a larger one, or is there any kind of scale? I mean, I don't know the details about what it's required, but I do know it's stringent. So. Sure, absolutely. Well, with um, with processors, they have a little bit different fee schedule um, from farmers, um, but it is based on the so they'll have their um, the application fees the same. It's 125. The inspection fee is 425 dollars, and then their certification fee is based on the number of gross organic sales. Huh. Okay. Um, so they could actually, if they wanted to pass that along to their clients, they certainly could. Um, and I um, would encourage people to look into the cost share because not only farmers, but also processors can apply for that farm service cost share program. So that might be something that would interest um, other meat lockers. We, we, we want to try and figure out what to do about it. So thank you, Katie. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. So much, Katie. And um, I wanted to share a personal story on, on unannounced inspections. Um, as some of you know, but I have my own personal USDA organic business. Um, I have the first and only USDA organic certified makeup in the United States. Feel proud of that accomplishment. But um, anyways, I when we launched the business, uh, we launched it in Colorado. We lived in Colorado. And at that time, we uh, moved from an apartment to a house. So then I had to submit to my certifying agency the fact that I was moving. I was changing locations because my certification uh, you know, uh, facility is my home. And I guess that might have sent them red, red flags is because I was changing facility within the same year that I applied for the certification. And at that time, you guys, I was nine months pregnant with my first boy, Walter. And so uh, I got a call uh, from the Oregon, uh, Oregon TILF, which is my certifying agency. And usually they don't even have to give you a call. They just show up at your door. But for some reason, I got a call from my uh, certifying agent and she told me, oh, Olga, I'm going to show up in an hour, but you know, I'll do an unannounced inspection on you. And you guys, I was so pregnant. I was so like emotional. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm getting an unannounced inspection. And what I want to tell you guys about the unannounced inspection is, you know, I, I passed it with flying collars, no problem at all. I did think that I was going to deliver my baby that day because I was just so amped up. Uh, thankfully, I didn't. I did a week later. But um a one big takeaway from an unannounced inspection for me, I am a small business, very small operation. But despite that, you know, they still pick me for an unannounced visit. And what that really does is it that, um, you know, keeps you accountable as an organic handler or processor or farmer, you just have to be a diligent about your record keeping, about your uh, bookkeeping, about everything, because, uh, you know, this can happen to anyone, literally. And so, um, you know, I think that that's another a beautiful thing about the USDA organic seal is that guess what, you can get this unannounced inspection. And guess what, they can take your product and send it to a lab and verify it that it, it is indeed organic, or maybe it's not. And then you no longer have that certification if you're not abiding by the rules. So, you know, from year to year, I have to recertify and you know just because I have the certification one year doesn't mean I'll have it again the next year so that's the really exciting and cool and neat um a thing about this logo is that you know um it really keeps people accountable and like Denise said earlier today it, it keeps you a better record keeper it makes you really think through and jot these notes down and you know for me, when I make a batch of our loose face powder, you know, I know each ingredient in each batch of that ingredient and when I bought it and when it went in and, you know, so I can uh, track back to 
every single ingredient when I purchase, if there's any issues whatsoever with that batch, you know, I know uh, very well how to handle it because I have those records. So anyways, without be going on a big tangent, just wanted to share that story with you guys. And we are actually at our break time. So um, if everybody wants to take a 15 minute, well, 15 minute break, we'll return at 1.32 and uh, Jim will take over and speak about the Orga o o grain compass tool. So yeah, just go ahead, stretch, stretch out, go use the bathroom, whatever you need to do, get a snack, and then come back at 132. We will be here. So good afternoon from sunny western Wisconsin. Um, we live uh, in a county right up next to the Mississippi River, Vernon County the headquarters of Organic Valley, of uh, cash and feed supply, uh, a, number of, a number of organic activities, including two certifiers, one of which I am a consultant for. Um, and we're gonna talk about something called O-Grain Compass today. Uh, a little background, a little, the genesis of this tool. Um, about 15 years ago, I designed for the university, well, actually for a farmer, a, a tool that gave financial and operating information so that that farmer could make good profit making decisions. And that was the beginning of a relationship I had with the university because somebody happened upon this spreadsheet tool and said, oh, wow, other firms can use that and so I partnered with a part of the university called Center for Integrated Ag Systems. And uh, John Hendrickson, who unfortunately is, is putting his dog down today and couldn't be here. Um, so I'm gonna fill in. I am not an employee of the university. He is, but I'll do. <laughs> I can explain it. You'll do good. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. Oh God. You, I'm saying you, you'll do good. I have all the confidence. Okay, good. So um, along the way, I, I do two things basically that pertain to agriculture. One is we have a grass-fed beef operation here in Western Wisconsin, very hilly land, not good for crops. Uh, we were organically certified for about 15 years back in the day. Um, I can't get money out of my certification right now, but I can out of simply being grass fed. So we dropped our certification. Um, uh, the the chance of, of converting to organic became a big issue in Wisconsin because of the dairy industry, but then went over to the grain industry uh, the motivation was obvious, and that is that the price, the market price for organic grain is quite higher across the board than conventional uh, grain. And, um, and so there's a lot of technology that people are learning to make that transition. But before everybody gets dazzled with the higher market price, they have to understand that there are higher costs in some cases, and they have to understand that there is a rotation that must be maintained where some of the crops are not as, as profitable as others. And so the university approached me and uh, a fellow from Compeer, uh, financial, uh, a, a big fin uh, agricultural financial lender active in three or four states, uh, a guy named Paul Dietman, who talks at a lot of conferences, um, and asked us to design a tool that would allow farmers who are contemplating a switch from conventional to organic production to determine what the financial impact of that decision might be. So at the same time, to support the technological changes from conventional to organic, the university hooped up, I don't know how these things happen, 
by magic, <laughs> an organization called Organic Grain Resource and Information Network. And that is the sort of the basket that all this sits in uh, with respect to organic grain. Uh, there is the web page uh, that gets you to their web, uh, web information, but also, and I encourage you to look into this, into a listserv, a, a email listserv that engages farmers throughout the, the United States, mainly in the upper Midwest, uh, so that they can tell about their experiences and ask questions of other people. Sort of a, a virtual town hall uh, affair. So if you look at this move from organic or from conventional to organic, there I've done a, a couple dozen, maybe more, three dozen financial analysis, either for landowners who want to rent to organic uh, producers or organic producers who are contemplating this and want to know the, the financial impact. Um, and what I've found is that there are some financial speed bumps that people have to be able to manage around. And this tool is a tool to help you manage around these uh, just by knowing what the impact will be. <clears throat> so there is a financial drag in these transition years um, where you're using organic inputs but getting conventional prices. Um, the upfront cost of increasing soil health is embodied in those three years. Uh, those who said, oh boy, here comes some C, C conservation reservation, CRP land. Um, I, can, I can make a bundle because I'll be certified right away, have run into big uh, expenses in increasing the health, getting those soils back to, to a healthy productive uh, level for organic production. And then there's the issue of crop rotations. Uh, the NOP rules around the subject of soil health uh, often require that a, a uh, rotation include uh, crops that may not be as profitable. I'm thinking hay, I'm thinking uh, some cover crops. Uh, and so, however, across the rotation, when you gain the, the benefits of corn and beans and maybe some, uh, some wheat of some sort or some other grains, you also have to put up with those years where you don't have much profit. So you have to look at the whole crop rotation. And then almost everybody, uh, unless they have a, a, a junkyard on their farm <laughs> with all kinds of old equipment sitting around, have to buy equipment that they're not used to using, uh, either used or in many cases uh, for the more sophisticated growers, some new equipment. And then there is the, the issue, uh, a, speed, a horrible speed bump can be the security of land. And what I mean there is uh, if you rent land, convert it to organic, uh, a landowner might be tempted and another organic producer might be tempted to bid the rent rate up on that land to the point where you have to give it up. And here you've stuck all this money in uh, into the operation, and you you've lost the land. With this tool, you can have a reasonable conversation with a landowner that could protect you from that that uh, trap. So uh, this tool looks out at profitability and cash flow uh, for ten years. And it's based on the producer's plan for crops, for rotations, for inputs, and what equipment they want to purchase. There are no, unlike a lot of crop budgets that you get out of the university system, there are no nudges. There are no, uh, here's how it ought to be. It's just a platform for a producer to examine the choices they think they're going to make going forward. The profitability is, of course, derived from, from price, 
uh, I, I'm sorry, income, the revenue, and that is derived from price and yield. And so we have to have the ability to input or predict price and yield. And then profitability is in, affected by cost. And those are things that a producer can pretty much decide. They don't have, they can, they have a much better guess. They have some control over that. Similarly, for purchase of assets uh, in the calculation of cash flow. So this tool allows you to play with your predictions of yield and price. It allows you to, to decide what cost you're going to have with respect to each crop and allow you to decide what purchases of assets you're going to make. The tool then can be used to analyze long-term financial impact of those choices, but also allows you easily to go back and make some what if assumptions. It didn't look good when I first did it. What if I, instead of raising wheat, I raised icorn or uh, edible beans or, or something out else out in those organic years? What if I uh, acquired land? What if I acquired some capital, other capital items uh, to, make, uh, to make the operation more, more efficient? So it's used for analysis, but it's also used to communicate to lenders. Uh, if you, I mean, that's obvious that if you go in with a good solid 10 year plan that you've thought through, that shows that you have a positive cash flow after one or two years, or even from the get-go, uh, you're you're going to make it easier to borrow money from a lender than if you just go in and say, "Geez, I want to go organic." Um, partners, uh, how to communicate with partners, uh, and the most important partner may indeed be your spouse. Um, to show, I'm going to make this wild move but here's what it can be. Uh, and I got this tool that says so. <laughs> and then communicate with landlords. Uh, a landlord who is customarily rented to uh, conventional farmers uh, and you, you approach them with the idea of, of renting to you, but oh, by the way, you want a five or six year lease or some version of that. Uh, they, wanna, they wanna know, can you make the rent? And the way that you can show that is to show them a 10 year financial projection. So I said, there are no sort of pushes or nud, nudges in the tool, there aren't, it's just a blank tool, but an accompanying document that was prepared by Paul Dittman uh, is something called, I like, love this, the university has great names they put on things, uh, turning grain into dough. And it, it is a sort of a tutorial on where you find information. Where do you find so that it, the history of pricing so that you can sort of look forward and predict? Where do you find yield information? Where do you find cost of production information? So that is all sort of explored in this. So now um, I want to go through the tool with you and we'll make this big enough for you to see. John usually does this. So what I do, my role is to do the math and, and the structure and then John makes it user-friendly. If you had to use one of my spreadsheets, you'd go crazy. But John makes these things very nice. They all have something called a user manual. And John has made this user manual very easy to use. Uh, it can be printed on eight and a half by 11 inch paper. It's formatted so that it's exactly seven pages long if you want to print it out. But it also has um, uh, buttons that get you to other items 
quickly. Here's a button to go to that tutorial I talked about. Um, and Jim, would you be able to click on the green button and just put make it make the spreadsheet full screen, please? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, might might be able. To. I I can follow those kind of instructions very easily. Green button, push. Yes. I got it. <laughs> so okay. so anyway, uh, so it goes down through each of the pages and has a little description of what we're trying to accomplish on those pages and some, some uh, source information to help you make these judgments. Then there are a series of pages that are in the spreadsheet book. One is crop planning, then a page for predictions of yield and price, a, a determination of what kind of costs you anticipate putting in each crop, what kind of gross profit you will earn after looking at yield price and expense, what equipment you may need, what buildings and infrastructure you may have or need, and then finally a summary page that show the financials along with a spread, a uh, uh, cash flow. So we're not going to dive deep into this because we don't have the time. It would probably take a couple hours to do a deep dive, but there's plenty right here that somebody could, and these sheets are downloadable. Uh, if you go to that O-Grain uh, webpage, you can find your way to this sheet. It's a free sheet, as are all the Compass products, and we have about four of the five of them now. And, and Jim, do you mind clicking on the crop planning? Just kind of like what John did last time. Sure, better do it. Show everybody how, sure. how yep. he looks. Will do. So uh, the crop planning page uh, asked the user to put in the beginning year. Uh, he, he, I had uh, 2021, but you can see that this is a, a live button that then takes you out 10 years. You put in the crops that you anticipate you might grow. Uh, down, these are all entry cells. Uh, and then whether or not from that crop, you will take uh, a residue, either stalks or straw, and how many acres that will be in transition or organic going across the 10 year period. We have some space for a, some specially manipulated, I will say, crops. Uh, a nurse crop, for instance, on, to establish hay is shown here. Uh, the cost page is different for that, so we've made it separate. And hay is both in the establishment year and in a production year, which is pretty standard uh, ag econ stuff. Iowa State University ag decision maker has uh, crop budgets for establishment year and production year of hay. We use the same idea. Then for those, these are automatically populated over here, the crops that you selected. Um, you pick the units. Uh, of course, hay might be in tons. These are in bushels or pounds. Um, and we ask you to go research with neighbors, with turning, turning uh, grain to dough, with any source you can. Uh, the University of Minnesota has fin bin, which shows other, what other organic producers have done with respect to yield. You put in a range of yields, certainly transition year yields, but in, orga in the organic years, a low, a base, and a high that gives sort of an envelope of your best guess is what the yields will be. And a, the same thing with price. Um, and if you are going to take stocks off, John has a little drop down here that looks just at the straw or stocks component. Um, and then for each of the crops that you input, corn, soybeans, wheat, crop, and the hay crop, 
we this page asks the user to estimate what these ex, all of the expenses will be for the, the particular crop. For instance, corn, um, crop seed. If you're going for a low, well, you're not going to go for a low yield, but if you're going for an average yield and in uh, uh, a higher yield, you may have a higher density, you may, you know, your research may tell you ways to do that. Uh, certainly fertility input might be a linear relationship with what you are striving for in terms of yield. Soil amendments, these are all changeable. That's pre-harvest. This is land prep, grain harvest, crop residue materials, uh, crop residue machinery operation and labor, and a land charge. And then there's an area that, that you can put notes so that you can come back to it. I wanna feature this, the Iowa State Machinery Cost Calculator helps you through anything that uses machinery field prep, planting, cultivation, cultivation side dressing of fertilizer. Uh, we use a portion of the numbers that come out of this calculator. There you can see the web address, that's the uh, uh, ISU Ag Decision Maker suite of, of crop budgets and machinery costs. Then we take everything that you've put in the first three pages and calculate a gross profit per acre for each of the crops you've listed if it's transition if it's low if it's if it's base if it's high and by the way i recognize we recognize and this is a fix that we're going to try to put into this uh, uh, here in the next uh, few months, that indeed you may not have high yields and high price at the same time. And so we, we need to build a feature in here that will allow you to, to put low yields and high price as an example, and maybe even on a continuum, a slider, if you will. On equipment, this drives cash flow and profitability. The user is asked to put in all of the existing equipment they have, what its current market value is. Uh, if you plan to sell it, what year you would sell it and about how much you would get for it. By putting a year in here, uh, if the current market value is $5 and you put in 2024, it pops up over in 2024. So um, the same for new equipment, what equipment do you think you're going to purchase? What year do you expect it to be purchased and what the price is? Again, we'll, we'll populate out here. Down at the bottom, uh, I have to explain this. This is something called a capital asset recovery ratio or rate. Instead of using depreciation, which is befuddled by the use of accelerated depreciation by most, most tax preparers. We talked to Paul and what lenders do is they look at the total stable of equipment in any particular year and say that there is a capital recovery rate that must be assigned to just owning that equipment. And Compare, they use 12%. You may approach a lender that has a different capital asset recovery rate 
So this is an input cell uh, depending on who you're talking to. But we have tested this 12% with organic producers, two of them, by the way, and, and our focus groups were in Iowa, a couple of big ones. And, and they laughed when they saw this because they said, that's, that's about how I figure it. That it costs, one guy said, it cost me about 15% a year of the total asset base for me to keep that stable of equipment up to date. Um, similarly, on, on buildings and infrastructure, um, dryers, uh, roads, uh, storage for equipment, et cetera, uh, list what you have. If you're going to keep it, usually that's a keep. New buildings and infrastructure, what year you're going to do it and how much it's going to price or you're, you expect to pay in price. And then the compound or the uh, capital asset recovery ratio for uh, for stuff on hand in any particular year for buildings is a smaller rate because of the longer life expectancy of buildings. And then finally, we summarize everything from the earlier pages. These darkened cells mean that there is no input here. It's from what you've done in the, in the preceding five, five cells. If you wanna know the detail, there is a way to look at the detail of every crop and the expense of every crop. On this page, we, the, the uh, person doing these numbers can put in a random selection in any of these years of a low, a base or a high yield and a low base or a high price. But it's overall, what we are going to do in this fix up is allow you to do that by crop. By doing that, you change these numbers based on what you put into the low, medium, and high categories previously. So that's gross profit total. And then there's overhead expenses that do not, that cannot be identified to a crop, like organic certification, farm insurance, utilities, uh, dues and professional fees, interest on operating loans, interest on long-term loans, uh, maintenance, et cetera. These are all changeable items. If, you have, if your Schedule F is constructed differently than what we've assumed here, you can change it. That gives you a net return from operations, if you will. And then cash flow incorporates that return from, from operations and adds uh, the asset purchases that you put in the pages called equipment and buildings. That's cash from the sale of equipment, cash to buy equipment, et cetera, for infrastructure. And then where you're going to get the, the money if you fall short, proceeds from loans initiated, <clears throat> and then payment of principal. Up here, you have interest. Down here, you have the principal payments. And then if you are immensely profitable, owner cash withdrawal. If you are not immensely profitable, owner cash from other sources that you stick into this new operation. <laughs> and it shows you then the cash result running across here. Yeah. Uh, Jim, do you mind uh, clicking on the bottom right-hand side to like 130%? just so that we can see the spreadsheet a little bit better. And I also have a few questions that have Ooh. come in. Uh, okay. Yeah, let's see 130 or 140, uh, just so that everyone can kind of see it a little bit better. Uh, yeah, let's do, let's do maybe 150. 
There you go. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, now questions. Yeah, thank you so much for creating this tool and explaining this tool and how you know um, farmers can utilize it to their advantage to really give themselves a, a perspective and an understanding of where their financials could be, uh, you know, up to ten years into the future. So the questions that have come in. What target audiences is, is this tool uh, designed for? Conventional wanting to tr transition or who are the kinds of folks using it most? Curious okay. or targeting purposes? Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm glad somebody asked this question because it reminded me of something I wanted to talk about. We've put this out and it went out to organic farmers and a couple of one person who was contemplating becoming organic the guy that was contemplating going organic he he understood it he went through it there the guys that had been in organic production a while we found that they are sort of constantly expanding if things look good or staying the same by expanding, I mean converting conventional to organic. So they're farming both organic and conventional. Mm -hmm. And so they've asked us, and we were are, we're working on a, a modification to this. It'll be called, I think, uh, O Grain Compass 3.0, where you can weave in conventional production as well. So it's a whole farm look now. It'll be it'll be conventional, transitional, and organic. So that's a modification we're making. Now, if the farmers that that we've shown this to, without a lot of handholding, were able to work themselves through this spreadsheet. But, but. Uh, I see service providers, extension op extension people, um, FSA loan officers, um, and private loan officers. Uh, in fact, uh, the the local FSA here in Vernon County, uh, she she and I have gone through this, and she just thinks this is fantastic, and actually asks farmers and holds their hand to fill this out for her because she wants to see 10 years yeah. to make a 10 year loan on a something. Yeah. Yeah, this is an amazing tool. I mean, I, I if I was an organic farmer, I'd want to use it. You know, I think as an organic farmer, you have to get used to the idea of recording and using lots of spreadsheet sheets anyways. So this tool can just be a complementary tool in your toolbox. Really. One of the one of the rock stars in organic grain production here in Wisconsin came up to me after a, a presentation that we made at the in in person O grain conference two years ago and said, Oh my God, I wish I had this when I started because I made a lot of mistakes. Yeah. And he said it would have been a lot easier to make the mistakes on paper than it would have been the way I did it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, so one other th one other change. Uh, while we're talking about changes, a huge change. So, you know, John and I uh, had both been organic. I consult for an organic certifier, and I realize the paperwork that uh, that an organic producer goes through can be daunting to some people. Um, one of the key documents that you fill out in organic certification is a a um, a field use a field use form and and so people are that are inorganic and actually all farmers think of rotations in fields not in total acres of corn and so forth this tool starts out with total acres in the change that we're working on right now you basically take your organic certification field plan your OSP, and you can input it directly into a new page we're going to put in front of crop planning so that it's a field look, not a crop look. 
Awesome. Yeah, that sounds like a great change. Um, the next question I have for you, Jim, is from your experience, do you see land values not rent higher for land that's certified organic? You mentioned using the tool to keep rent. Right. Yeah. Land. So, so just to explore this a little bit, here's my my experience with the, not my personal experience. Well, yes, <laughs> I lost a farm that I sort of that I that I went through transition on when we were certified. But uh, the first question is, do I see organic land renting at higher rates than than conventional land? Only if there is a community of organic producers. If, if you don't have a community of organic producers, the, the rental rate will be, especially in Iowa, where you have a lot of, of rental auctions, it will go down to the auction price. And the danger for an organic, uh, an organic producer is that you start renting at the auction price and the auction price grows. And so you have to you have to anticipate that depending on your area. Um, the dirtiest thing that can happen to an organic, an organic producer that, or a, a producer that transitions land is for another organic producer to come to that landlord and outbid you or put pressure on you or promise that, you know, maidens will come down and kiss the landowner. I don't know. But, and and uh, to, to be very snotty about it, if you are an organic producer that has transitioned land and, and now the landowner wants to take it away from you, they're gonna ask you to sign a prior land use declaration, a PLUD, that says it's been managed by organic means. <laughs> If you really wanted to be dirty about it, you could say, no, I'm not going to sign that. Uh, unless you compensate me for the loss. And by the way, I can, I can tell you what I lost. I've got that in a tool. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know anybody that would be exactly that dirty, but I, it ran through my mind when I had a small farm taken from me. So no, bottom line, no organic land, if there are not a lot of organic producers around, organic land is not going to rent at a higher rate than conventional land, okay. number one. If there are a lot of organic producers around, you've got to think about how you handle that day when one of those producers comes and tries to take this land away from you. Good, uh, Make sense? good takeaway points for sure. Yeah, thank you. That was great, Jim. I appreciate it. And then uh, the last question, um, and we are running a little bit short on time, but what is the biggest reason for dropping the certified organic for your beef operation? Is it processing or are the premiums needed for certified organic beef in stores too high? And so the market isn't there. Um, if, if I were direct market, if I were big into direct marketing, I could have probably gotten money, extra money for being organically certified. In the grand scheme of things, certification cost is not great. You know, it, uh, one of these, this certifier that I help out, uh, we were looking at a farm maybe four or five times my size. And, uh, you know, they, they probably were selling 50, 60 beef, beeves a year finished. And their certification was, I don't know, it was the inspection and everything, maybe about a thousand bucks. That's nothing. So the reason that we dropped it is that I didn't, we weren't big into organic uh, or into direct marketing. And the number of folks that I could get extra money for a beef from, I think that's right was very small. Organic Valley is a big buyer of organic beef here, but not grass-fed organic beef. They want grain finished organic beef. So that ruled that out because we have a hilly farm. I didn't want to raise crops. And 
And I certainly didn't want to buy organic grain because the cost of organic grain is driven by market forces, not by cost. It's, and I just, I couldn't make money that way. But the grass fed portion is growing by leaps and bounds. And as a matter of fact, uh, we, the domestic production of organic beef can is only 15, 20% of all the, I'm sorry, your, the domestic production of grass-fed beef is only about 15% of the total amount of grass-fed beef that is consumed in the United States. The rest of it comes from outside the United States. And so there was good premium, there are good premiums for grass-fed beef. Um, and so that, and, and I, so, Organic certification. I mean, we haven't changed anything. We, we've most of the protocols under which you sell grass-fed beef are almost exactly the protocols of organic beef. Got it. Um, and, Got it. and so we haven't changed anything, but we're getting the grass-fed beef premiums. Okay. Awesome. That's great. That's great. I'm, I mean, really curious about the meat side of things because that seems important part of these systems. So, it is. Um, it really yeah. is. I, you know, and I, looking at financials on organic farms, the minute that you stir cattle into these, uh, you things look better. Uh, if you can graze cover crops, if if in a rotation, if you have, if you, you've convinced. NRCS to put fencing up for you. If you run cattle on a year that would ordinarily be, you could call fallow uh, with respect to crops, run cattle in there, uh, you're, you're improving soil health. I mean, it's just a win-win if you stir cattle into these operations. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jim, for, uh, you know, the presentation and creating this amazing spreadsheet and this resource for organic farmers. We'll go ahead and um, jump into our next presentation, if that's okay. Bryce uh, Erlbeck uh, will be the next presenter. Uh, we are running a little bit late on time. Bryce, if you go want to go ahead and uh, start your presentation, kind of tell a little bit about you and your history with organic, that would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, thank you. Well, and, I, and I'll bring Kyle in here too as, uh, as we move through it, we can kind of do it together and, and go back and forth here. So uh, one second. Now I have to figure out how to make this bottom. There we go. So I uh, appreciate everybody coming out today. And Olga, thank you for having me and the, the previous presenters. Uh, I come from the, the, the farming background as well as the entrepreneurial startup background in, in uh, um, the organic space right now. So uh, we, the, the, what I want to talk about first is the, the b and Earlback Farms, which I believe, well, it's a, it's a centennial farm and my dad and I ran it, uh, run it right now. And our organic efforts began in 2015 when we were about 800 acres and we we're conventional. I just gotten back from Africa and Brazil and we uh, looked at the farm and just knew that neither of us could come back and do anything conventionally unless we wanted to take on a bunch of Denton farm, uh, 15, 20,000 acres. And that wasn't uh, what we wanted to do. So we took the farm from uh, 800 acres to about 4,000 acres now all organic row crop and we'll probably double again this year uh, that uh, we, we've been able to put a system together that has allowed us to manage this effectively. And I, I've heard some really good things before. We don't do animals, we do fake animals uh, in, the, in the sense of the crops that we grow. So we grow a lot of alfalfa. Uh, we do three years of alfalfa, three years of row crops. Uh, and in those three years of row crops, there's a, a small grain in there as well. And potentially no-till soybeans. So we're really only doing a till, heavy tillage on the corn. So that's how we've been able to manage that to, and to, to do it long-term. And Kyle, I will let you give a background on your farm. Now, I know the, the slides aren't gonna show up for you, but uh, I'll step back and let you give a background on your farm. Yeah, 
So Kyle Schnell from Newton, Iowa. I farm a thousand acres, 800 of it's going to be organic this year. Uh, Bryce actually uh, helped me get into it. My interest comes from soil health. Um, and then the profitability is where the organic comes into it. So um, I don't know, this will be my first year uh, with certification. Um, I'm also doing 500 acres of alfalfa, and then I'll be doing no-till uh, soybeans and trying to do no-till corn as well. Thank you, Kyle. And it, it's uh, one of the things that I was able to learn during my process is uh, uh, transition through alfalfa. You know, it's it's once you put the numbers together and understand the risk and the insurance and, and everything through it, alfalfa, even with $5 corn, I, I'd have to check it again, but I still think it makes sense for the weed pressure and everything. And, and that's what I was able to convey to Kyle and he followed through with it. So he'll be set up for a, a great first year of organic production. Uh, the one thing that we uh, talked about the entrepreneurial side of it, uh, from going to 800 to 4,000 acres, I've probably made $2 million worth of mistakes. I uh, still made money during that time, don't get me wrong. Uh, but me and another partner that farms about 12,000 acres just outside of Omaha and another large grower just outside of York, Nebraska, knew things were getting out of control pretty quickly on our growth trajectory and where we're headed. That we took uh, all of our spreadsheets, all of our uh, shoe boxes, and, and all of our uh, uh, binders and folders, and we built it into a digital platform that uh, we can do full certification without having any pieces of paper. We can uh, track everything live as, as it's happening in the field. We can take all that stuff and put it into a, a format on a digital platform that allows us to see our rotations, our expenses, our profitabilities, our revenues. Uh, tracking corn all the way from the field back to the, or from the, from the BOL all the way back to the field digitally uh, through the system and have that in, in the click of the button. So certification for us right now is really just a couple of clicks of the button when the certifier comes and it's pulling off uh, all of our reports to our seed tags that we took pictures with of, of and uploaded into the system. So we've really digitalized the system and allowed us to get, utilize the information instead of uh, put it in a shoebox and hope that uh, we get through certification as when we started. And it's allowed us to grow and understand our numbers that you know, we, we didn't understand alfalfa was the key to success uh, until about year three, four, when we started picking out the data and information from our network of about, I think we're at 100,000 acres now uh, of data and information that we're sifting through and understanding and being able to pull that through has really helped me. And I'll go through that a little bit today uh, as we move forward here. So Kyle, I'll let you go first on this one. Just uh, what, do, what have you learned, I guess, from the keys of success uh, through, your, your, what, through your transition period? Oh, knowing there's a lot more to farming than just uh, going back and forth and knowing the uh, I don't know, like the life cycle or um, the environmental impact of, you know, fungus and bacteria and everything that your normal farmer doesn't uh, pay attention to. They just put fertilizer out there and go, but there's a lot more to it than just that. Perfect. No, and I think from our standpoint, it's learning what we're good at in the farm, uh, especially with organic. There's so many things you have to, to understand and, and to be, you can't make mistakes as you can in conventional. So I, I not to spend too much time on this, I, what, uh, bringing other people in to help you and learning from them and being able to accept that you can't be perfect at everything and having that support system and that help will, will make you much more successful. So just from our standpoint, some of the strengths that we brought, I brought was the agronomy. My dad's very good at equipment and I understood insurance. So we built in the record keeping. We hired that done through the company that I built now. Uh, we have somebody that's from outside of our farm that does it all for us. I don't worry about it. Uh, it just happens. And long-term rotation planning, that's bringing in all the data and information that we get from being a group. Uh, input on best practice and innovation. Just me buying my chicken manure earlier this year saved me $150,000. We're, be, we're able to understand these swings of chicken manure from pricing 
as of going on from application to, to purchases. And then crop marketing. One of the biggest things that I've learned is the people that are buying your grain and selling your grain from you have two objectives. They want to buy your grain at the lowest price possible and resell it at the highest price possible. And they have way more information than us as single farmers do. So getting the information that, that you need to market your crop is not easy. And doing it as a single farm is pretty, pretty difficult because me calling around and asking three people is not a, an idea of the market. Uh, what we work through is a, a, an advisor that understands you know, what ports are shut down around the world, what, uh, what's going on with the organic certification, what, uh, what happened during COVID, those type of things. So those are things that we hire out and uh, work with other, uh, a group of people to do. So Kyle, I'll let you talk about the, the transition or go ahead and talk about the transition. We, we do it the same way as, as you would. So uh, just how it worked for you. Yeah, it was my first time ever planting small grains in my entire life. So I took a 30 foot uh, John Deere drill and then put an air seeder on it um, with seven and a half inch spacings. And then the air seeder just blows it in between the rows. Um, and then I rolled over top of it. Um, but last year the oats were, I can't remember. Do you remember Bryce what the yield was? Was it like 40, 50 bushels? Yeah, 40. So, um, and then I got one cutting alfalfa. I broke even on everything. Um, it was a hard year last year with the uh, upfront cost of alfalfa with only a marginal cutting, but uh, got $3 for the oats with uh, 40 bushel. So it, it was hard, but uh, this year having the alfalfa in full rotation, I was able to um, net $300 per acre. So that was my most profitable, um, acres on my farm this year. Were you, were you caught in that, that storm then Kyle that went through or what? How oh yeah. Yeah. The whole grain bin facility blew over and one landed on top of the shop. Yeah. It wasn't good. Perfect. Yeah, I think uh, we, we've taken the same approach. Everything we transition is oats and alfalfa. Uh, to, actually, we actually do an extra year of transition now with the corn prices. We'll have about 500 acres in alfalfa that uh, we'll leave in one more year. Just as Kyle talked about in our area, it's profitable to grow. And, you know, just 750 corn, I might as well grow a, another year of soil building, weed, weed suppression, and nitrogen producing alfalfa on, on a few of our few of our acres. So just an interesting thing that's left us options. And I think Kyle's doing the same thing as well. Yeah, right? that's, what even... yeah that's what I'm doing. Uh, I'm only going to have a hundred and what was it? 15 acres of corn this year to play around with. And then the rest, I'm just going to leave an alfalfa. It's a guaranteed income. Don't Is that to... alfalfa going to be just a conventional priced alfalfa then? Or yeah, you're yeah, not the... going to try and get a premium for it? No, we can't really find the premium around uh, here right now. So just going to be conventional. And Bryce Kim has a question. She says, isn't alpha alpha an extraction crop? It is. And that's a big point before we, we did this, we went through and understood our cost of fertility uh, and where I'm at, there, there's literally more manure than there is acres. Uh, so we have a cheaper cost of fertility to replace these. And we do different things such as compost to not over apply manure, uh, take out the nitrogen and just get the P and K. And then we supplement with potassium sulfate as well. So is it, yes, it's not all gravy. There is, the uh, alfalfa is a heavy feeder and it doesn't work in some places because of the cost of nutrients. Thank you. So just going through a few more things here. I mean, these are just pictures of the uh, transition oat field that we have uh, near, near Madrid, Iowa, that uh, we work with a, an individual. And they did, last year was a good oat growing year, I think for Kyle, too, I'll let you, you talk about that. But they did 80 bushels, about 36 pound test weight. And I only planted them at a bushel and acre because there's alfalfa under there. And then that storm came through after we cut those. It's interesting because this the person that owns this field uh, he's a, a, a very wealthy individual out of Houston, uh, Texas. And he called me, asked me if we're hurt by the storm. And I said, no, we, we have everything harvested. 
And uh, we talked about, you know, how rotations really mediate uh, risk uh, in, in crop production. Yeah, if we had corn standing there, it'd be all flat. And, and we had a good talk about that. So ways to incorporate the landowner to understand uh, what, what you're doing. So Kyle, how did your oats do this year? Uh, they did 75, so pretty close to your 80. Um, yeah, the storm went through here as well. And I had plenty of neighbors come over and you know, when I first started my transition, they all thought I was silly. And then they came over and complimented me and said, uh, you know, being diversified or whatever really paid off. And I think it did. So the one thing that we just I share with everybody is what we look at on our uh, uh, activity planning. This we plan out at every activity and we've even We've even uh, took it to a not as deep level as I get in my plans, but we look at a you know, return to land without a uh, return to manage without land about sixty dollars the first year is what I planned. So in our area, rents three hundred to four hundred dollars. So I'm losing two hundred dollars an acre. And conservatively, on the second year, I, I'm bringing back around that three hundred dollars an acre. So it's a it's a break even. I think it'll actually be profitable this year for us in the transition just with where the alfalfa and the grain prices are going, but just an easy breakdown that we we put together just to let people know there could be a big dip in the first year uh, that will usually make it up in the second year, if not be profitable with the way alfalfa is going. Um, one of the things I like talking about is the, the pros and cons of alfalfa, because it's not all gravy, uh, but we've learned it's an integral part to making us successful. So with the alfalfa, it minimizes risk and not just risk of taking out weeds. If, if I take out an alfalfa stand and plant corn and I plant corn and it rains for two to three weeks, I still have a really good shot at that organic or that organic corn. Uh, it just slows the weeds down and, and that can happen. So we control impact my timing. I'm not trying to buy green or any type of paint uh, to, to get through my rotation. And we actually sold our weed flamer and uh, uh, zapper and everything else. We went to just a rotary home cultivator and looked more at the cultural control. And it's a lot cheaper. We're spending a lot less money and getting a lot higher yields uh, to that. So I think that's the pros. The cons are the upfront investment in alfalfa, not just uh, the monetary means, but it's taken us five years to build an alfalfa market that's uh, respectable, that we trust. And it's not an easy thing that people are going to wait five years to be able to do that. And then being able to manage alfalfa equipment investments in, in the market. So it's really an investment. And I think in the long term, it pays off. We've seen it through our information data that we have. And we understand it can't be done everywhere in the US, but there's a lot of excuses of why people don't do it. I think it can be done most places in the US. So just looking at uh, uh, going through the season of one of our cornfields here in Manning, Iowa, uh, 34,000 was planted in this field. It's 113 day planted June 1st. We always take the first cutting of alfalfa before we plant. And this forces us to plant later, even if it's a nice May. Uh, it just, it's one of those trigger mechanisms that doesn't allow us to go to the field on May 5th. If, if everybody's done planting that we, we really push it back. So uh, the, we were planting on 180 bushels here, be conservative. Uh, taken off two and a half tons of alfalfa before we planted corn at $150 a ton, paid the rent on the uh, on the farm. So uh, we'll skip that one. Here's the, the field uh, on June 29th. Uh, it says planted fit, June 5th, it was actually planted uh, June 1st. And what we've really done is try to cut our work. And so this field was only cultivated once and rotary hoed once. And we had a severe drought. I think we ended up with 13 inches of rain total all year. And we saw a huge difference in this field than, than a lot of the fields around there. So if we look here, this is August 10th. I think this is a few hours before that storm hit. And we didn't get the brunt of it here, but we did uh, get probably 10 to 20% damage on it. So it, it still looked very good. And if we go to the next page, uh, going through a drought, getting planted late and uh, getting uh, Dureco hit on it. it, still did 175 bushels. Uh, with it, it's usually a 240 bushel conventional farm when we farmed it, but we we're very pleased with 175 bushels off of it considering the year. And 
our cost into that farm was about four hundred forty-four dollars. Uh, our return before land was about eight hundred eight hundred sixty-seven dollars, and we add about a three hundred fifty dollar land cost into there. So, and we don't have the alfalfa on top of that as well. So again, the the we go to alfalfa through the the transition and through organic production three out of six years because it really leads to lower organic corn costs and less variability in organic corn yields. And it really adds to that sustainability. So, I, Kyle, do you have anything to add on that? I know you haven't gone through an organic corn year yet, but uh, no. I think you're, you're seeing it as well on the, the alfalfa productivity. Yeah, there was a question about applying chicken manure and how you're supposed to incorporate it in the soil. And she or whoever it was wanted to know how you handle that. So that's where I was a little bit nicer. We don't have to incorporate it. Um, and but we don't usually use chicken manure on our, our alfalfa just because the nitrogen to potassium to phosphorus ratio uh, doesn't really match up to what we want to do. We're just going to apply excess uh, nitrogen. We apply uh, compost to cattle manure uh, to get the P and K that we need and ratios that we need and we'll supplement potassium sulfate with it. Uh, as far as working in uh, chicken manure, I know there are some states that differ than Iowa where you do, you have so many days to work it in and so on and so forth. We just don't have that in Iowa. So I don't, I don't uh, have a good answer for that question. Kyle, do you know anything on that? I don't. Are anybody else on the call? There's another question that said, are we in danger of losing certified acres this year with $5 conventional corn? So I, I don't think, I, I, yeah, the, the, the answer is yes. Um, and I don't think it's because of $5 corn exactly. It's because a lot of people went into this thinking it was a, a million dollar idea that you didn't have to do much work on and they never really changed their mindset of how to think about this. And I think that's more why people are going back than $5 conventional corn. Um, it, it, you can't grow corn and soybeans and make this work long-term. It's just not going to happen. And you can't put as much hog manure out as possible uh, as, as slopping off your field, try to raise good high corn yields. You have to change your thinking. You have to change your mindset. And, you, and I think that's more the case of people going back. They haven't done that. I don't know, Kyle, what's your thoughts? I know you've, I, I've had second thoughts on converting more acres, but I look at it and I, I don't, yeah. you're going ahead with it. So I, it'd be interesting to get your thought, Kyle. Well, all, like I started out, it comes down to soil health and this journey um, allows me to do that. So really don't want to go backwards. So I, I asked that question, this is Gary, and I have a brother that does some of his land certified organic and he's, thinking he's not gonna do it again this year. So it's just anecdotal. Um, but I think you're right, Bryce, with what your response was, um, yeah. Yeah, I'd say in our network, we don't have anybody that's taking the land out per se. Um, yeah, there's some people slowing down transition, uh, which is probably a good thing for some of the people doing it, uh, that it gives them a chance to wrap their, their arms around what they're, what they're currently doing, so. And these slides, I, I can go through them. We raise barley during transition once. Uh, I like small grains during transition and it allows me to focus on organic corn. It doesn't uh, take away management from the organic crops, but I'm also not going to get any more, any weed pressure because I'm going to harvest before weeds go to seed if something would happen in these fields. So we've done barley, uh, all small grains, oats, things like that, usually under seeded with alfalfa. Um, uh, I'm just going to go through here. The, the things that we thought about uh, through our system is, is how people make decisions and how uh, I made decisions through the first three years of organic and it's changed the last couple of years is when we first decided to transition economics was the biggest uh, driver. How do we not lose money? Uh, management was the second one. How do we manage it? And the third driver when we started was agronomics. Today, that has flipped on its head. Our, our biggest driver is agronomics because uh, it's going to drive management. And that management is we don't want to spend our entire lives at the farm. We like doing other things too. And so agronomics is really going to drive the management. And economics, is, believe it or not, has become such a sm much smaller piece and it's really taking care of itself 
uh, when we've got the other two things right, that uh, uh, it's, it's, we still look at it as still very important. It's not like it's a teeny thing out there, but it, we are able to make enough money to then figure out how to do the agronomics right and the management right and the economics followed through it. So this is a very interesting thing that we've learned uh, I've noticed how our decision process goes. And Kyle, I'll let you talk about yours as well. I guess I don't have a whole lot of input because it all makes sense how you just kind of laid it out there. Um, start with the principles and then end up with the money. <laughs> yeah, it, it takes a while to end up with the money. You got to gotta do a lot of things right. And so uh, we, we just talk about the right rotations, the, the weed management is again, that corn, soybean, corn, soybean, and even one year small grains. I, I don't see it working long-term on many farms uh, and, and being able to be viable uh, economically with all the equipment, the weed issues. You know, if it wasn't for crop insurance on a lot of farms, it, it wouldn't be viable most years. And so weed management uh, and then resetting it. Uh, the, the three years we go back to alfalfa is resetting our farm again. And then fertility, is reduce the cost of fertility. I, I see some people can spend three, four hundred dollars an acre on fertility. Uh, we've got that driven that down to about eighty to one hundred dollars an acre, and then balancing the NP and K of not uh, thinking, not just over applying manure to get the highest yield because it's going to mess things up long term. And how do you do a rotation that supports uh, healthy soil and the micro microbial fertility, which it's amazing. A healthy farm in organic is so much easier to maintain and to prosper off of than, than a, a degraded soil that is over applied NP and K or under applied or hasn't had a rotation type of thing. It's, it, it, it's just night and day difference that uh, uh, what you're able to do on that farm, which leads into soil health is you're actually getting a benefit from soil health uh, in, in the system. So Kyle, I know this is a big uh, driver for you. So what are you doing on the soil health aspect of it? Well, trying to start off with no-till, like you said, you did what, five out of six years without tillage. So I think it starts there. Um, diversity, um, not doing the same thing over and over and over. I know we're doing alfalfa for two to three years. And I think that's a key because you're not over using the I guess the soil or whatever and wearing it out and you got more than just alfalfa there's grass out there too so it's not like you're sucking all the carbon out of the soil. Um, fertility instead of just guessing testing um, I'm using AEA products with John Kemp so using sap analysis and really making sure what's actually in the plant and not just in the soil making sure everything's balanced and that goes back to diversity. Um, I don't know what I diversity with uh, I kind of want to do field peas because then you harvest in uh, June and then that gives you the rest of the year to do like soil building through like a seven way cover crop blend. I'd like to get uh, cattle in there, but I don't have any fences because those all got torn out over the last couple of years. Um, I don't know. It's, it all comes down to having a plan and kind of sticking to it and always looking ahead. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I agree with the, the assessment of uh, earlier when people were talking about cattle. Uh, if you, if I could pay, make cattle pay grazing in our area and I had somebody to manage it and knew how to sell and buy cattle, which are big, big ifs that we haven't learned. Uh, I, I agree. It's a, it's a great way to do a rotation. It's just for us, it's, if you put it in a, put it in numbers, I can lose more overnight on cattle than I could ever dream of, uh, yeah. of repaying. And so that's a, that's a one reason we don't do cattle. We're not good at it. We don't understand it. We don't have knowledge to do it. Uh, and that's why we decided to go the, the alfalfa route. So what I'm doing right now is just using my neighbors. He's got like 300 heads. So when it works into the rotation, I give him a call and we try to graze out there for a month or so. And, or some winter grazing uh, helps him out, helps me out. It's a great partnership. One of the things that we looked at, and this is coming from both my farm and, and all the data that we've collected, is looking at rotations. And I corn, soybean, small grain is essentially what uh, 
uh, we looked at for rotations and in the returns. This is not counting land into it. Uh, it, it even this rotation long term is difficult uh, to be to get weed suppression. You almost need two years out of corn and soybeans, just from what I've seen. Uh, and the increased amounts of tillage that you're going to need to make this rotation work. The advantages of, of how we think about this is uh, breaking up the, the crop weed cycle and disease potential. And it provides an opportun opportunity for a strong cover crop uh, with the organic winter wheat. But thinking about it a little bit differently here, as we take a corn, barley, soybean type of, uh, uh, of rotation, the disadvantage or the advantage, disadvantage of this is wheat suppression will get more difficult over time, but I still think it's better than the previous rotation we did. The soybeans will require walkers and require work. And, and uh, we don't grow soybeans on my, my, my farm. I don't grow soybeans organically. Uh, just the, the numbers don't work out for us to manage it and do it successfully uh, and, and make any money at it until they hit about $25, $27. And that's, that's just us. But looking at this type of rotation, how we think about things a little differently is if I had the barley in there, I could take the barley out, plant my rye on time. And from what we've seen in the data and statistics we have, the, the no-till rye works pretty good if it can be planted in August. Uh, highly likelihood of chance of success. So looking at a barley, take the barley out, put rye in, do no-till soybeans, and now I'm only really managing uh, the, the row crop corn with tillage. Those are the things that can make a difference on a farm by switching a few things up. Now, you know, barley after corn, there's some disease issues that could come up and things like that. So we really need more information to weigh that out. But those are things that we think about and do. Uh, and then where we come from, top, ex, top notch execution is, is the, a need and, and data and information to make that happen. So, uh, and I don't mean to rush through these, but I just wanna uh, hit on it, that the economic returns are supported by the right rotation. And again, we look at this uh, right rotation is different everywhere, but I think the, the basis of it is more important than, than anything uh, of having a diversity of crops. So, and we just look, as they talked earlier a little bit uh, from the agri-scare and our farming side of it, go back here, is balancing out uh, not just one field, but balancing out the whole farm it's easy to think about one field rotation, but how do you balance out and plan a rotation around uh, uh, farm income and not having, a, the common thing I hear with organic growers is, let's do all organic corn the first year, because yes, if you put it on paper, it looks like it makes the most money. And then they say, yeah, we'll pay everything back and then we'll do it right. Well, something happens the first year, or it does happen that they do really well, and they're like, oh, let's do one more year of corn and that corn falls way off the, 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 the mountain. And now they have to do all soybeans and they don't have a rotation built. And we have this huge fluctuation of incomes and nobody's happy. So building out, even before you start transition, how things are going to roll out uh, as you talk 10 years, something that we do on our farm and we promote uh, a lot of other people to think about that as well. So, Kyle, I'll let you, I mean, I don't want to put that in there. Our takeaways are just planned out rotation. Each, each region's different, but the principles that we use on our farm is break up weeds and disease cycles uh, by soil health and then understanding workload management capabilities, equipment use efficiency, uh, and those type of uh, information data that you need to make decisions. And then evaluating cost of nutrients and creating and increasing availability of nutrients within a cycle are the big things that we've seen. I guess, Kyle, do you have anything to add to that? Well, um, maybe networking. I think that comes into a big play into this as well. Um, you've helped me out a lot with different contacts and it's a different part of organic because, you know, in conventional, I go harvest, I go see my local elevator, uh, get my coffee and then go home. And it, it's just something you don't think about because it's already planned out. I would agree the the networking planning and uh, it's just uh, you, I, exactly right. Awesome. So th that's what we have, Olga. I know. It, awesome. Well, I, uh, I actually do. Have, 
I do have a couple of questions. Thank you so much, Bryce and Kyle. We really appreciate your um, feedback. So I do have a question that has come in from uh, Roger and he has about 70 acres um, that he's looking at transitioning to organic. Um, and so he's just looking at ways in which he could utilize this land. So this is his question. Um, what, what, here, let me see. Uh, would, what would we like to do is use the land in many different ways. And if that allows for us to rent to one grower for a crop one year and rotate to another grower year two and so forth. In other words, multiple growers contracted years ahead, this could, could simplify the expenses and reward the growers that may specialize in a particular crop. Have you ever heard of this kind of concept or you know, what are your thoughts on, on that idea? Yeah, I, I think it's a great concept and we actually use it uh, quite significantly on our farm. Uh, we don't do much of the hay management actually. We, we, we set up uh, local people that have all the equipment and time to do it. And we hire them to do all the hay or we do it on shares or we have uh, certain other uh, entities chop it. And so I think really focusing on what you're good at in organic is a key thing and, and working with other people that uh, are good at the, for us it's alfalfa, uh, that uh, are able to put it up, do a good job doing it and manage it and uh, have the skill and knowledge to do it. So I think it's a really good idea to, to uh, source out to people that are good at a particular skill. Thank you. Uh, another question has come in from Dustin. Have you seen any trends, those who are interested in transitioning to organic, younger farmers, land, land owner driven or other? I mean, from my point of view, it's very interesting. I think, you know, we don't see a ton of younger farmers do it, I would say. I mean, I think it, that trends just as much as 40 to 50 year olds, you know, 50 and, uh, and above farmers. I you know the, the what we get back is that there's not enough career runway to to make this worth the effort to do it uh you know some of the the very interesting things is, is very very extremely wealthy people that either just sold a business um and, and have the extra capital to do something different we work with a ton of those people that uh went on out and bought five seven hundred acres and they don't want a conventional farm uh are they so, some scenario like that that just uh different than the average farmer that they, they, they don't want to be, so. And would you say that you also see a lot of farmers that have dual systems where they have conventional uh, land, but then they're interested to pursue organic too? I'd say that would be 70 to 80% of the people we work with. Okay, okay. Yep. So that's the good, the big chunk of it, basically. And, and this is Dustin again, just to follow up and so i mean those outside investors are those folks who then are operating it or is it just investment and they'll have somebody do it for them? so so most of them are those folks are still operating it uh um it is just a it's a hobby for them and it seems like there's a lot of interest in that uh in the last you know three months and maybe it's because we're not seeing a lot of interest from the conventional farmers to switch anymore that we don't get the calls from them and we're getting, you know, the calls from these people that are, are doing it for a hobby. That's why I'm seeing it. But that's that's what we're seeing here. And not so much investors operating their own, just, you know, family, people that have sold out of something, moving into farming that want to want to do organic. So I'd say people that didn't have a background in farming before that are getting into farming now and, and going straight into organic. Um, Roger actually had a follow-up question. Uh, do you guys grow your own small seed crop or do you buy it? So we buy most of it. Uh, we grow some of it for cover crops we grow, but if we're going to harvest it for seed, we'll buy it. Kyle, what do you, you, what do, you do on yours? Uh, I've been harvesting my own for the last two years and then going to get it cleaned and keeping it back. Uh, Kim has a question. Did you say you do not do your own record keeping and bookkeeping? Do you hire someone or use a software? 
So uh, for us, that's uh, AgriSecure, what you've seen on these slides that I utilize today. Uh, that's a company that I built and the, it does the certification for you. Uh, you can either do the, have the platform or you, we have a, a person that comes with the platform. And I actually uh, have turned all of my certification stuff over to uh, uh, individual within our team to do that. And the reason is I feel comfortable. I can still see everything going through. I can still see what's going on. Uh, I just have somebody else managing it. Uh, my time is better spent uh, uh, managing other things rather than that, that record keeping. And I still get all the data and information from it. And it's, it gets done and I don't worry about it, but uh, I, 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 don't, I don't do much of it anymore at all. Gotcha. All right, thank you for the answer. Um, I believe I got all the questions that have popped into the chat, chat box. If there are any final questions, guys, feel free to enter them in a the chat box or even pop in live. Gary, did you have another question? for Bryce? Um, I do, but it may not be one. Okay, I have two. You digitize the record keeping system that you put in place. So if you were a producer to use that, would you be taking pictures of seed tags? I mean, how, how do you keep that stuff all digitized to be able to use that record keeping system? Yeah, yep. So you build the field plans out and then the field plans will have different things. For example, you asked about all right, so field A has a, a Pioneer, or let's say Blue River, whatever, whatever their Blue River seed, that goes into another part of the, the system. And you can take a picture as you're out in the field or you're loading the planter, upload it there, and it'll stay there until certification comes. And it'll also send us notifications. So how I know things are getting done, I get a weekly notification that says, yeah, these seed tags are uploaded, these aren't. And then I can yell at my dad that's back home planting to say, you know, we need to make sure we get these uploaded. And the, the person that manages our account also uh, uh, is able to keep track of that. So seed tags are one, invoices, uh, manure affidavits, you can send out and get back. Um, BOLs are generated electronically, clean outs, all that type of stuff. So like a, a equipment clean out, you can get on your phone and you'll have a work order for that. So say, oh, I'm planting here. The planting work order will be May 5th. You open it up, it'll have your clean outs that you're going to do. You check it off that you can do it. You can take pictures of it, whatever. It'll file it away and then we'll pull that report during certification time. So many different ways that we digitalize it, I could go into. And, and it sounds like Kyle, you you use the AgriSecure platform too for your record keeping, correct? Yeah, I met Bryce. Uh... What was that, uh, Iowa conference? Uh, PFI. Yeah, there you go. I, I met Bryce there, and I knew Bryce previously. And then uh, I was there for the cover crops, and then he was like, what about organics? And I got me thinking, I'm like, I don't know. And then we sat down and ran through a, like a spreadsheet of what it would cost and my profitability. And then the light bulb went off, and I was like, okay, let's do it. Wonderful, thank you. Could I ask one final question then? I don't know yep. if this is, okay. So there's a lot of talk right now um, at USDA and other places about paying for carbon sequestration. Are you in the loop on what that conversation's about? Because there is this feature that's being discussed that's called additionality. And it's where if you have a healthy organic soil that won't sequester carbon because it's full, that's not a part of what is going to get a carbon sequestration payment because it needs to be a soil that has the ability to capture carbon. You know anything about this and how can we make organic farms uh, rewarded for their ability to mitigate climate change? I mean, I think uh, I think it's perfect government uh, standard to make sure you ruin your farm and then rebuild it again to get paid. Um, <laughs> it seems about about right. But as far as the, the the carbon credits, I have very little knowledge on it. I don't follow it. I just have so much else going on. I know I'll turn it over to Kyle. He's done a lot more in that side of it than I have. Yeah, I uh, I currently work with Indigo Ag. 
Um, I got paid for them, but it seems like if you have degraded soils, you're doing tillage, um, high fertilizer, high fungicide, insecticide, and you uh, start to change, uh, you're getting paid off a of change pretty much. Um, since I was somewhat already doing the right things, my payment's actually a lot less, which I don't seem or see as fair, but they're trying to change that as well. Well, I, 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 I appreciate being paid for doing something good, but I don't think there's a, a, a value to not paying somebody who's also doing good. <laughs> so yeah. anyway, that's my point, so. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I'm more interested in, in how we do it within the organic or regenerative or whatever you wanna call it and keep it in that sector than to go to a mass sector because uh, you'll just get lost in that. Yeah, well, you guys, um, we're coming up to the three o'clock hour and uh, unless there's any more questions, we'll um, thank you guys for uh, being here today and thank you for everyone in attendance. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Um, as part of our grant that we received from SARE, we actually have to report back to our grantors uh, regarding our attendance and feedback from our attendees. So I will be um, sending out a short survey to everyone that attended and would really appreciate it if you could please complete it. We value your feedback and we uh, use it, utilize it for future events and workshops to really serve you the best possible way we can. And Bryce and Kyle and Jim and Katie, uh, thank you again for your time and for your expertise and being here today. Um, we really appreciate you. And, oh, and finally, I always forget to say that I'll be uh, posting this recording on our YouTube channel and I will go ahead and share the YouTube link with you with everyone in attendance and feel free to share the YouTube link with anyone that you feel could benefit from this workshop and there's two more upcoming workshops the next following Tuesdays from one from 12 to 3 that you know you can certainly attend there are on our calendar and you can RSVP there thank you guys have a good day, everyone. Thank you.